Hi, I'm Raj Kletke. As we shelter in place during this COVID-19 pandemic, I thought I'd present in several parts a brief lecture that I gave recently trying to get more fly fishermen interested in entomology. While staying at home, in addition to the house repairs, of course, that we want to get done before the fishing season starts, perhaps we can study a little entomology. This talk will move quickly, so there will be many exceptions to what I say, and I should quickly cover a few definitions. We use the term hatch loosely. Technically, a hatch is the stage of an organism leaving the egg, which is a non-fishable event. I prefer to use more specific terms when appropriate, but I still will use hatch sometimes when there are numerous organisms of a specific type or stage available to the fish. My hatch may or may not elicit active feeding by trout, and this feeding may or may not be selective. I'll use the term searching when I'm fishing without an apparent hatch. When I retired, I decided to learn some entomology as it relates to fly fishing. I enjoy this kind of study and hoped it would make me a more knowledgeable and better fly fisherman. I'm still learning. But why should you learn entomology? Will it help you catch more trout? I can't guarantee that, but I'm sure that it will enrich your time on the water and definitely will improve and enrich your fly time. Incidentally, I do strongly recommend taking up fly tying if you don't already do that. Nothing makes your trout fishing more enjoyable than tying and using your own flies. Some of you may know more entomology than I do, but even if you don't, many of you are likely better fly fishermen than I am. So let's take a look at some skills that make a good fly fisherman. Knowing where the fish are, especially when feeding, is known as reading the water. Of course, the fish are feeding on organisms, so knowing where and when organisms are, in other words, entomology, is a big part of reading the water. A very important skill is accurate casting and manipula manipulating your fly line to try to make our flies imitate the behavior of a specific organism, whether it is dead drift or with a little motion. Of course, knowing how that organism behaves is entomology. Knowing the season, observing the water for active fish and water type, and knowledge of entomology may help you decide what fly to tie on, but sometimes choosing a fly to use isn't that critical. You already have favorite flies, and friends in fly shops will always give you advice. Sometimes an attractor fly will work better than an imitative fly. I've caught multiple nice trout on a Chernobyl ant. Since I like hatches and imitative flies, my comment when catching trout this way is always, this is really sad. But in a normal day of fishing, there will often be times when an attractor fly works best. Sometimes a general imitative fly of an organism that is intermittently available to the trout will be the fly of choice. And sometimes, especially during a hatch, a very specific imitative fly may be the best choice. When to use an attractor and when to use a general or specific imitative fly are also part of entomology. So, entomology is much more than just identifying an organism, but today we'll be concentrating on identification to a broad group scientifically known as an order. General behavior of that group and the flies I use and how I fish them. The example organisms are so common and so widespread that if you trout fish this year, you will see these organisms if you know what you're looking for. Entomology can seem overwhelming at first, so how do we get started? Let's start with things we already know, and you can expand from there as hopefully your interest increases. You can make entomology as simple or complex as you want. Every time you go fishing, take a little time to actually observe any organisms you see. On your way to the water, note grasshoppers, ants, flies in the bushes, or on spider webs. Note any organism on the water and whether fish are taking them and what water type they're on. Before wading into the water and starting to fish, take a moment to note any rising fish. Lots of rises usually imply a hatch, and I hope to help you define how to recognize the likely organism. Rare rises more commonly means opportunistic feeding, and I hope to help you define what organisms are likely intermittently present. No rising fish doesn't mean that there is no hatch of some sort going on, but the fish could also be dormant or opportunistically feeding beneath the surface. I hope to help you decide whether there is a likely organism in the drift that you should be imitating 
or whether an attractor fly or even a streamer might be your best choice. Obviously, if you see organisms, try to capture one and note its size, shape, and other features. I hope to get you capable of general identification today, but even if you don't know what it is, try imitating the organism as best you can and fishing it in different ways. Look up the organism when you get home. Sometimes that will explain why it did or did not work, and that's starting to learn entomology. Additionally, when fishing is slow, pick up stream vegetation and rocks and various water types. Try to identify what's there. Here are some midge larvae, some caddis cases. Note that these are somewhat square in cross-section in this particular species, and an immature clinger nymph. But don't over-interpret what you find. You really need to know what organisms are present in the drift now, not what organisms are hiding out under rocks. But this does help you see what organisms are present in your stream, what water types they exist in, and general sizes of common organisms. It may help for future fishing decisions. I like the scientific classification and learn best when I have an organizational system. But don't worry, we'll be using the simplified classification for fly fishermen with names you've already heard and likely already know. You're already familiar with many of the common terrestrials. When you see these organisms in the woods or meadows as you walk to the stream, they may be a reasonable choice as they are intermittently available to fish, especially if there's a slight breeze. When present, most of these are excellent searching patterns fished on or just below the surface. Commonly, you'll fish these dead drifts, but throw a grasshopper into the stream sometime and watch how it reacts. If you see lots of rising fish suggesting a hatch, other choices will likely be better, although I've caught many trout on ants during hatches of other organisms. I've seen several hatches of size 22 flying ants also, for which I was ill-prepared and unfortunately didn't catch anything. Sow bugs and scuds are crustaceans, not insects. So technically aren't studied under entomology, but they are very important to the fly fishermen. They are easily found on rocks and vegetation in many streams. Sow bugs look like the little pill bugs that you see in your garden. Scuds are more like tiny shrimp, but you can lump these together. Various sizes may be present and they are in the drift frequently enough to make good searching flies when you're nymph fishing. I commonly use a caddis larva and a size 14 sow bug or scud for searching. For sow bugs and scuds, I tie a minke, which is a heavily weighted spiky fly on a size 14 straight hook. I don't even put a shell back on it like a classical sow bug or scud. I'm fishing it thinking that I'm using it as a sow bug or scud, and the fish may be taking it as a sow bug or scud, but they may also be taking it as a caddis larva or just something that looks alive and reasonable to eat. You can see more about sow bugs and scuds, as well as how I tie this fly in my series on simple entomology for the fly fisherman, part four. I'm going to discuss midges next because I think they are vastly underused. Technically, true midges are in the family coronamids and in the order Diptera, but as a fly fisherman, we'll use the definition of anything that's small that doesn't fit into one of the other orders. You've already seen some midge larvae. They look like small worms. They are literally everywhere on most trout streams in all bottom types and all water types. They come in numerous colors, but color generally is not that important. I use almost exclusively black. You're familiar with caterpillars that become butterflies through pupation. Well, midge larvae also pupate on the bottom of the stream, and then the pupa rises to the surface, sheds its outer skin, and emerges as an adult. The larva will get knocked into the drift and will be present along the bottom of the water column sometimes, but generally more pupa will be in the drift and present at all levels. The pupa has a thickened thorax with legs and wings. Midges are by far the most numerous and common insect on most trout streams, and a few midge pupa are in the drift and available to trout almost every day of the year and 24 hours a day. Essentially, there's a low-grade midge emergence consistently and constantly on trout streams. But trout must get more energy from a food source than 
it expends to get the food. So a trout is unlikely to expend much effort, move any distance through fast current, or come to the surface to take a single midge. But if a single midge drifts by closely while the trout is feeding, it will likely take the midge. It just won't move far for it. Another benefit is that many fishermen don't use midge on many trout streams, so trout don't seem to become pattern shy very commonly to midge patterns. So any time so anytime there is not a better choice, fishing a zebra midge at any level in the water column is reasonable. If I can encourage you to try one new thing after this talk, it would be to tie up some size 20 zebra midges and fish them. I know it's difficult to believe that a decent fish will take something that small. I had a hard time believing it also. So what I did and would recommend to you is to add the zebra midge as a dropper when searching with your favorite dry fly. Or if you're searching with a nymph, add it to your favorite nymph. Soon you'll believe in midges also. Midges also have concentrated emergences and trout will often feed actively. Midges are present throughout the water column during a midge emergence and trout may take them at all levels, so a zebra midge may still work. But usually trout will feed most aggressively at the level where the food is most concentrated for a midge emergence that is just below, in, or on the surface. You can make a surface pupa pattern by replacing the bead of a zebra midge with a tuft of antron, zelon, CDC, etc. Try this pupa pattern or fish on the surface with an adult pattern during a midge emergence. So how do we recognize a midge emergence? Well, midges are small and hard to see. Since each midge provides only minimal energy, trout commonly will move to an area with minimal current and have quiet sipping rises so they don't have to expend much energy. A somewhat useful rule of thumb is that if you see many rising fish on quiet water and don't see an organism, it's likely midges or occasionally mayfly spinners. And you can usually find the mayfly spinners if you look closely at the surface. In contrast, on rapid water with more active rises, it's more likely to be emerging caddis, but we'll talk about that later. Adult midges on the surface of quiet water cause these little light sparkles, these little dimples on the surface, which Hewitt rated as the number one factor in attracting trout, and this is likely what trout see. A Griffith's gnat causes these little light sparkles, so is the classical adult surface fly to use during a midge emergence. Many more sparkles are present than a single midge would cause, of course, but midge clusters are common, both during emergence and in mating clusters, and I don't think trout count very well anyway. I've caught trout with this fly when my other patterns failed, but on quiet water during a midge emergence, these are other patterns that have been more useful to me. My favorite is the tummel fly in the upper right in size 22, which basically is a small soft hackle that I fish in the surface film. It may seem counterintuitive, but sometimes with midges, a dead drift is not the best way to fish your fly. Small flies, like midges, have trouble breaking through the surface tension on quiet water, so there may be many struggling midges that are vulnerable to trout. A little movement of my tummel fly has been helpful to draw attention to my fly. This likely represents a struggling midge. Just be sure the movement is minimal. You can see more about midges and how I tie some of these flies in my series on simple entomology for the fly fishermen, parts 5 and 6. Well, that's long enough for this video, but we still have some important entomology to talk about. So join me soon when I discuss caddis, mayflies, and stoneflies. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.